Good day, this is Jim Pytel from Columbia Gorge Community College's Renewable Energy Technology Program. This is Digital 3 EET 123. Today we're going to finish up our memory and storage chapter with a grab bag of topics, namely memory expansion, special types of memories, and testing schemes for memory and storage. Computers have two ways to make themselves smarter too, and how they do that is basically they can increase the number of addresses or increase the number of bits in an address. So let's think of our of our memory array here. Let's just use a two-dimensional example for this one, a two-dimensional array of 1,024 addresses. And in each one of those 1,024 addresses is stored a single byte of information or eight bits of information. Okay, so how do we increase the capacity of this memory? How do we expand it? Well, in their particular case, let's talk about word length expansion. So word length expansion is how to double this capacity is at each address, make more bits available to it. So here's another eight bits. So at address, zero here's eight bits there's eight bits so that's 16 bits you've doubled the capacity of this memory so that's the first one that's word length expansion and again just to just to make sure that you're absolutely certain of that is you're increasing the number of bits at a single address okay increase number of bits at an address. The second way to do this here is, again, let's use our ten twenty four by eight bits there. Increase the number of addresses. So now here's another ten twenty four locations of 8 bits. So this is basically word capacity expansion. So word capacity expansion is increase number of addresses. And you can do both. So I've doubled the amount of addresses and I've doubled the amount of bits there. I've quadrupled the capacity, the bit capacity of that particular memory. So let's use this in three-dimensional. Let's do it this way. For a three-dimensional array, and the analogy I used for these guys was skyscrapers located at intersection of streets where a row column Word length expansion. We were having an eight floor skyscraper. Word length expansion means our skyscrapers are now 16 stories high. Word capacity expansion means our city got bigger. There's more columns or more rows. Okay, some pretty simple concepts, word capacity, word length expansion. And how you typically do this is if you want to go ahead and increase the memory of your computer or if you are assigned to a team to upgrade you know certain things what you have is these memory modules sims and dims single inline memory module dual inline memory module what's the difference single inline memory module it has some memory on it and there's a single row of connectors and how they pop in it you guys may have done this already before on some of your own computers and stuff like that they just pop in like these little slots with like these little connectors that snap in from the side dual inline memory module same thing as a SIM, 
but you guessed it, there's two rows of connectors. And sometimes these are proprietary in the fact that you have to, uh, they have special shapes and special holders. Okay, so that's pretty much it for word length and word capacity expansion. Um, there's some special types of memory that we want to discuss. Okay, so these special types of memories, the first one is our FIFO. First in, first out. Next guy is our LIFO. Last in, first out. Some of you guys with accounting degrees may already understand FIFO and LIFO accounting. It's kind of the same, but totally different. Um, we'll use a mnemonic device here for each one of these guys. FIFO, that's Tetris memory. LIFO, this is bullet memory. And I'll explain what I mean about these things in a little bit. So let's first off talk about FIFO. So first off, let's talk about Tetris. Remember the game Tetris, where these shapes of varying shapes and colors would come down and you had to like stack them up. I don't even remember what the thing was to make it. Anyways, the state the the shapes had come in, and if there's no nothing below a shape, it would fall to the bottom, right? Falls to the bottom. But if there was something below that shape, it would stop. Okay? So let's move on from this analogy and show you how this works here. Okay, so our typical shift registers, which we've been using, D, Q, previous stage is D, or excuse me, previous stage is Q, is the next stage is D. Previous stage is Q, next stage is D, and it comes out. We want to store one, our previous discussion of shift registers, traditional shift register, registers, clock pulse comes in, the one is shifted there. Next clock pulse, one is shifted there. Next clock pulse, it's shifted there. Okay, so that was our traditional shift register. A FIFO, in contrast, is Tetris memory. If there's nothing stored in there, it falls to the bottom. Next clock pulse comes in, you want to store a zero, it falls to the next available spot. The guy before it, is filled so it stacks up on top of it. And then let's say we want to store one. It falls into the next available spot. So the first in, which was our one, is the first out. Okay? So you don't have to wait for successive clock pulses in first in, first out memory. Okay, which brings us to LIFO memory. Let's go ahead and erase all this. So let's use our analogy here of a spring-loaded magazine where there's a spring, well, obviously a spring at the bottom of the thing, and you got a bunch of bullets. that you want to put into this spring-loaded magazine. In goes bullet one, pushes the spring down. In goes bullet two, pushes bullet one down and the spring down. Now all of a sudden comes a bear and you want to shoot the bear. Which bullet comes out first? the last one in. Bullet two is the one that hits the bear. Okay? So let's stop with the stupid analogies and actually discuss how this works. So 
last in first out memory very similar to our little bullet in the magazine um application here is let's just draw something here where here's a bunch of registers and they're stacked on top of each other so that's a computer term basically here's your stack and let's say they're loaded in parallel let's load one zero one zero it's loaded into that register now quite like our bullet analogy here comes one 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 it pushes down one zero one zero when it is loaded in and now last in first out the next data that you want available because these are bidirectional is one 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 because the last one you put in now along comes zero zero one one you guessed it, it pushes down and it's the next one available. So the last one in, the first one out. So how this is actually done in memory is this thing called a stack pointer. Because to do this here, this whole, this goes, into, goes to that one, that one goes to that one, that one goes to that one, would be pretty complicated. So rather than, um, moving from one register to the next register, you know, which would be pretty complicated. You just load a register. And then when the next, and then the next register, that's called the top of the stack. So right now, previously, that was the top of the stack with the stack pointer address, you know, and our address was location zero, 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 one zero zero so address four that was the top of the stack and now we put in our one zero one zero and we change our stack pointer so now this top of the stack is three so we haven't really done any shifting or anything like that so these things are kind of unnecessary now that's the top of the stack we load in quadruple one change our stack pointer to say that two is now top of the stack Okay, so we're avoiding all that unnecessary um, data transmission within the memory, okay, by using a stack pointer. And this is uh, what analogy can I use here? Um, this is like towels uh, coming out of a, a dryer and you're, you're stacking them up in your, in your hamper. Here's my towel. That's the top of the stack. Here's another towel that I folded. Now this towel is the top of the stack. Now this towel is the top of the stack. That's that's the same analogy that's going on here. By use of a stack pointer, you can avoid that whole moving your towels down to the next level or anything like that, which would be stupid. Okay, let's talk about um, testing memory here. Okay, one of the most obvious ways to test memory is if you've got ROM. It's got a bunch of stuff on it that you just made. That's your fresh copy. And here's your original. What you could do is go by this exhaustive address by address comparison using a comparator. At address zero is bit position seven equal to this bit position seven. It, address zero is bit 
at position six equal to this one? You know, yes or no, and you would have this error. Okay, let you're going along. Yes, 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 yes. Good, good, good. And then finally, you get okay. There's a difference right here at address six, bit position two. So that fresh copy is is bad, and you can junk it. Um. For obvious reasons, this is pretty cost prohibitive, not only because it's time it's time expensive, you know, it's, uh, I don't know if that's a word, it's, it takes a long time to do it, but what about this error? Your original has a, has a flaw in it. You know, let's say it was a flaw that, um, that was undesirable and your false your fresh copy has it so it also has a flaw it's not telling you that's an error and these things are going out into the world and causing some problems or let's say the original has the error and the fresh copy doesn't what you're erroneously saying is the fresh copy is bad and it's not you're wasting some materials there so there's easier ways to do this thing and one of the ways is very similar to our parity discussion we had here. And it's a way more complicated than the book has it. And I'm just going to, I'm going to stick with the, the book's definition of it, but let you guys know it's way more complicated than the book actually has in it. It's just a simple, simple explanation of it. And this is via checksum. So checksum. Whereas this right here, this is equivalent of giving your car an inspection from the ground up. You're checking the tire pressure, you're checking the brakes, you're checking every mechanical component in the car. A checksum is more equivalent of, okay, I got four tires, I got a little bit of gas, and I'm good to go. You know, 99% of the time you'll be good to go. But one of those times, it's basically a faster method of checking uh, memory, but not as exhaustive as this method here. So checksum, how's it done? Checksum, let's say these bits are in our, let's, let's say it's a four-bit word here. And there's, I don't know, like four addresses. So it's a 16-bit capacity. And I'm just doing this here. I don't know what that represents. Basically, we know what parity is. You know, parity, if I wanted to have even parity for this bit, I would have to add a 1. Same thing here, 1. Here would be a 0. And here also would be a 0 to make these even. Well, this checksum here is, even though these might be unrelated bits between the columns here, you actually just do a parity for a column. Okay, and what happens is basically you generate this checksum from your new fresh copy and compare it to the checksum of the original. And 99% of the time, you're going to catch that one error, let's say, here, your checksum on the, uh, on the copy for the whole memory array is triple one zero, but you should be coming up with one zero one zero. It's going to flag an error. I don't know where the error is. It's somewhere in this column right here, but you know it's bad. You know you have to recopy or junk that one. Okay, so that's what checksum is. Like I said earlier, it is substantially more complicated than that. And if you guys have time in lab, I'll talk to your talk your ear about it, off about it. Um, that's a coding class. So if you ever are interested in that, just take a coding class. I'll talk your ear off about it. Okay, um, so that's one method of uh, doing uh, testing. 
as our checksum. Um, another way to do it is to make sure everybody can load a one, make sure everybody can load a zero. And just this basically this massive write and this massive erase. You know, so everybody gets a one. Are they capable of storing a one? Are they all capable of storing a zero? So that's another another quick way of doing that. But there lies a problem in that means of uh, you know kind of this massive testing is let's say this guy and this guy are shorted together those two cells right there so whatever value this guy has this guy also has whatever value this guy has this guy has so you would never catch that error yes each one can hold a one or a zero but you're not catching that um that particular error where one is following the other. So that's why this is normally done in a checkerboard. So no cell has the same value in proximity to its neighbors. Uh, I'll just do this again. And what you do is just load a pattern like that. Is this cell right here capable of storing a one? Is this one capable of storing a zero? You know, but if there was a short here, there's an error. And vice versa. You make sure, okay, now we know that one is capable of storing a one and that one's capable of storing a zero. Just alternate the pattern. So what's the problem here? It's that guy right there. You know, yeah, he was capable of storing a one. Oh, what am I doing here? What's what's the error here? Oh no, yeah, it's it's this guy. You know, he was capable of storing a zero, but he can't store a one for some reason or other. Okay, so that is a checkerboard pattern. Um, there's a means of, uh, you know, doing this for uh, for RAM also. You can go ahead and, well, actually, yeah, RAM is the checkerboard pattern testing. There's basically a, a flowchart indicating, you know, because this is an exhaustive, uh, a pretty exhaustive. Well, this right here is a mass. You know, you're doing this in mass. But now, what you can also do is step through. Now you've got this pattern right here, and you can do this flowchart step through here, where now I go one for each individual cell. Did that change these guys? No. Give it a zero. Did that change these guys? Nope. Move on to the next one. Give this a zero. Did it change any of these guys in close proximity? Nope. Good to go. Give this guy a one. Let's say that guy accidentally changed. There's something wrong in that column right there. Okay, so that's how you can do that. And of course, it's going to take a little bit more exhaustive means of checking. You wouldn't be you wouldn't be as fast as our massive checkerboard here. But uh, all it's basically doing is stepping through, do, alternating individually each cell to make sure that there's no shorts between it. Okay, so let's finish up memory and storage.